I have. Do you mean being able to wield the gap? watching City Council. It is now six o'clock. I will start the meeting. Begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could real quickly do roll call. Good evening and welcome to the September 28th, 2016 meeting of the Economic Development and Housing Commission. Tonight's agenda is available on the counter along with a request to speak cards. A reminder to everyone that requests to speak that requests to speak cards should be completed and turned in to the commission clerk. If you wish to speak to the commission regarding an item on tonight's agenda, please write the item number on your card. If you wish to speak on items not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of this commission, please do so during the general administration section of tonight's agenda. All speakers will be limited to three minutes. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and televised, so all speakers, in order to be recognized, must be called on by the chair and come forward to the microphone. Speaking in public may cause some individuals to be uncomfortable, so everyone is asked to be professional and respectful at all times. The first item on the agenda will be uh, the general administration uh, presentation, um, presentation by the public on matters not on the agenda. Um, and I'm not seeing any, so we will move beyond that. Uh, the next is the uh, consent agenda. Uh, consent, consideration of approval of the May 25th, 2016 Economic Development Housing Commission meeting minutes. I move to approve the March 25th minutes. Do I have a second? I'll second. All approved, say aye. 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 Nay, any nays? All right. Minutes are approved. The next item on the agenda is a consideration of a proposed modification to the inclusionary housing program by uh, staff member Huerta.
Good evening, Mr. Vice Chairperson and members of the Commission. Uh, this evening, we're asking the Commission to consider and to recommend that the City Council approve uh, some changes to the City's uh, for sale component of our inclusionary housing program. Since uh, its implementation in 2005, the inclusionary housing program has been largely successful in creating low and moderate income housing, both uh, rental and for sale. Unfortunately, the housing market and collapse of the uh, financial markets created significant uh, challenges for the continued implementation of our inclusionary housing program. <clears throat> Tightening of lending restrictions and underwriting have uh, resulted in almost impossible uh, means for our buyers to get financing for these inclusionary homes. Uh, the, resale in, the resale process itself has become also very cumbersome um, and very time consuming whereby staff has to negotiate these sales and, and explain the whole process to underwriters, loan officers, agents, uh, owners themselves. So it's, it's very time consuming and uh, we have often had to reduce our existing notes on those uh, properties thereby foregoing uh, those funds that could be used for other affordable housing endeavors. Uh, the proposed changes uh, that we are recommending would allow the city to sell the restricted units at market um, and eliminate or try to eliminate any loss um, on our existing notes. Uh, we would also recapture the funds uh, from the payment of those notes. Uh, the funds would be deposited into our housing trust fund, which is the main housing fund for other housing activities. And monies from those housing uh, trust funds can be used for uh, gap financing, say, for affordable housing projects. It could be used for other programs geared for low and moderate income households. Um, the, the bottom line is that, again, the program has become very cumbersome. Um, unfortunately, it's not very workable in the current um, housing market and uh, we need to do something uh, because we do have an increased, we have seen an increased number of resales because of the improved housing market. But again, with the tightening of these lending restrictions, um, it, it is just very complicated to find lending for these, uh, for these potential buyers. Uh, that's basically the, the, um, my presentation. I'll be more than glad to answer any specific questions that you may have about the proposed changes and and um, any other questions that you may have. And if I could just add um, to Raul's comments. So uh, Raul and I have been with the city long enough where we actually started this program uh, back in the mid 2000s. Uh, we we administered it for many years and it worked in its time, uh, kind of pre-recession. But it's come to a point through the all the all the uh, points that Raul made about lending restrictions and, and just overall, um, just when you do the math on some of these, when we're actually having to reduce our note, uh, it becomes a burden on administration and really it, it's just an inefficient way to use the, um, the asset that is this, uh, the funds that are tied up in these loans. So this really comes down to using the money that we get back from these uh, homes in a much more efficient way. Um, it'll, it'll move away from you know the the home ownership side more to rental housing, but that's really more efficient, uh, and, and we've been more successful in producing units that actually meet the the need here. So, um, so yeah, just just wanted to uh, recognize Raul for um, taking the initiative to you know push these changes. That have really been a couple of years in the making, but we think it's time. So thanks. Any comments from the commissioners? Yes. So based on your comment, I just heard uh, that the housing stock will be uh, decreased, the inclusion housing stock, as they sell. Pardon? Th that is correct. So uh, we're only talking again about our for sale component of the inclusionary housing program. We're not talking about the rental, which is really the, the major component of our inclusionary housing ordinance. But any existing for sale units that are restricted, currently restricted, as they come up for, for resale, we would allow them to sell those units at market. And again, we would recapture the funds from the existing promissory note that we have on title. 
and those are the funds that we would collect in the housing trust fund for future affordable housing projects. Um, so yes, uh, they, they would be released and sold at market, but again, the funds that we would be capturing would be used for other affordable housing projects or programs. Typically apartments is what you're saying. Primarily, it, you're mainly looking at apartments, but there is, um, you know, we could have programs where we could assist home ownership. Uh, we currently have a first time home buyer program, as most of you know. Uh, we could certainly look into um, the future using some of the funding uh, for additional down payment assistance or, or other types of assistance programs. Um, but the fact being, again, that managing restricted for sale units becomes very complicated, and, and that is the main reason why we're proposing these changes. And, and just to add, the uh, first time home buyer program is actually funded by other sources that don't require those resale restrictions. Uh, in the past, we used state grants for that. We wouldn't, this, this would not take away from that program. We would continue to operate a first time home buyer program to achieve that objective of home ownership, affordable home ownership. Uh, this really just deals with um, whatever the number of units is that are left. And it's just a case of as those units are sold, we're, we're recycling that money in a way that produces. Um, not only more affordable housing in, in the areas that need it, um, but also it does it in a way that leverages the dollars a, a lot more than doing, um, than, than keeping them with these inclusionary homes. Uh, the report says 90 affordable home ownership units. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. Uh, the, originally, that was a number of affordable units that was created, about 90. We currently have less because we, we did lose some units um, primarily through uh, short sales. Um, we did have a couple of foreclosures as well. I think the current number is probably more around high 70s. I don't have the exact number, but I think originally that was the, the number of units that were created, for sale units. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any additional questions or comments? I'll just ask one. Uh, peak of the recession was 2009, so it's taken a couple of years for you to make the switch here and propose this, or is something happened more recently that? Correct. So it's mainly the the tightening of those lending res uh, the, the lending requirements and the underwriting requirements that have created the the issue. Not so much where the the peak was. Um, and, and it's primarily tied to uh, the loan-to-value ratios and how underwriters look at loan-to-value ratios. In the past, um, underwriters would look at the actual market value of the unit when doing the underwriting. So that allowed for our note to be uh, implemented within the underwriting and not cause any problems. Now they are probably doing what they should have been doing in the first place, perhaps, and, and looking at the actual value of the unit, uh, the market value or the resale price, the lower of the two. And that's where we have problems because we have on top of the first financing our promissory note, and that completely um, blows out their combined loan-to-value ratios. And so that's where we've had to adjust our notes to try to make them come within those ratios. And every time we do that, we're effectively losing those funds because we're having to reduce the notes. The other factor that came into play, uh, that was more, more recent, but also the loss of redevelopment uh, was our main source for, for funding other sources of affordable housing. Um, so we used to you know, have to set aside 20% of those funds uh, for this. So now that that's gone, we don't have a, a mechanism that's reliable for that. Uh, we have to look at every resource we have very carefully and use it in the most uh, efficient way. And, and, and the money that's tied up in, the, in these homes, um, in addition to being under a system where it's bound to continue to go down because of the scenario that Raul just explained, um, it's also the opportunity cost of not allowing these, these when the homes sell, to recapture the funds and use them in a more efficient way. So, so that's the other factor. It was, it was more recently the lending restrictions um, kind of midstream between what you said about 2009 to now, uh, the loss of redevelopment made us ha really have to rethink our entire affordable housing program. So again, I'll 
show my ignorance here, but the inclusionary homes are below market value just because of the deed restrictions on them. Is that what I'm understanding? So market value allows you to recapture the full uh, outstanding debt on it, including correct. your notes. That is correct. I see. Okay. Thanks. And my understanding, too, is it, I'm thinking very specifically of the houses out in the Riverwalk, the first ones built. Okay. Yeah. That uh, one of my staff recently looked at buying one and decided not to because there was a cap on what he could resell it for. Uh, correct. And so that kind of goes back to uh, Mr. Campbell's question about the, the resale price being restricted to being affordable. So we do put a restriction on the maximum resale price of those units. And that's how we maintain the affordability of those units um, uh, currently. Uh, and so this would remove the cap people could resell it at market rate? Correct. So this would remove the cap. We would allow them uh, to sell those units. By, d by doing that, again, we would recapture that existing note. It's a shared appreciation note. So we would not only capture the existing principal, but a portion of the actual appreciation on the value of that unit. Which I totally agree with, and I totally agree with everything. What is to keep all 40 of these people from putting their houses on the market the minute this gets passed because they can? Uh, there is nothing that would keep them from doing that. If, if all of a sudden they would all come at once, hopefully they won't. But. Um, but they would certainly be able to do that if, if the changes are, are approved. Um, again, it would facilitate those resales. It wouldn't be um, very cumbersome because at that point, we would just be treating it as, um, as a recapture. Uh, we would just have to do a payoff demand for those, and our funds would be repaid at close of escrow. So, Wasn't there originally a requirement that if they bought one of the affordable homes that they had to live there for a certain number of years? No. Okay. No. Had to remain owner-occupied, but there wasn't a uh, residency requirement. Correct. Yeah. And, and uh, the only other thing I'd add on that is that um, as, you know, uh, people would be able to sell their home, sure, um, but there also is a, an incentive that comes with this change to, because uh, right now one of the philosophical issues we have with the program has always been um, what's the incentive for homeowners to maintain their homes and improve their homes when the resale price is artificially capped? So now that that's gone, um, you could argue that staying in the home has its advantages as well because now you're able to actually recoup the, any investment you put into it uh, down the road. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens on that. The market is obviously really strong right now, um, but I don't think we foresee a, a, a mass exodus of, of residents in these homes, but, um, but we'll see. Would the existing owners be able to refinance? They have always been able to refinance, uh, and we would subordinate as long as they were just refinancing for a rate term reduction. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't allow them to do any type of cash out or paying off of debt. But if, if all they wanted to do was refinance to take advantage of the lower interest rates, we've always allowed them to do that. And, and we also have actually allowed them to sell at market rate, but they're just a really, you know, tedious process. And maybe you could describe that, uh, how that works. Correct. Now. Yeah. So um, as we noted earlier, these are restricted units. And whenever there's a resale, homeowners have to um, put the unit up for sale. Uh, to a qualified buyer at an affordable price that we provide, usually for either a 90-day or 120-day period. Um, during that resale marketing period, they have to um, actively look for a qualified buyer, market the unit. If they're not able to identify a buyer within that 90 or 120-day, then they have the option to request that we allow them to sell that unit at market. So that has always been part of the uh, regulatory agreements, just to ensure that if they need to sell the unit, they're not going to be stuck uh, without being able to sell it. Um, so what this would be doing would be basically eliminating that requirement for them to wait the 90-day period. And at the time that they wish to sell, they could initially, uh, immediately opt into requesting that they sell the unit at market. But that's a very good point. They have always had that opportunity to sell the unit at market and for us to recapture that note if they were not able to identify a buyer within that 
resale marketing period. But just again, seeking more education on your housing program. Um, so the financing, help me understand the structure of the financing. The homeowners themselves receive a first for whatever they're able to finance. The note becomes a bridge between the sales price and their ability to secure financing. Is that how I understand it? So the value of the notes vary based on uh, the financing structure? No, so the, the value of the note is set when the unit originally was built. So the value of the note is the difference between the market value of that unit when that home was initially sold by the developer and the affordable price that that initial buyer purchased the unit at. What happens in a resale or the way that the program was structured in a resale, the, the new buyer would assume that existing note and it would just be transferred over and over. The, the initial intent of that note was not really to recapture it because we wanted to maintain the affordability, but it was really to ensure that those units were not sold without the city's knowledge. Um, obviously, if, if somebody tried to sell it, they're recorded on title, so we would immediately be notified if they hadn't notified us initially like they're supposed to. Um, but again, you know, when the new buyer is looking to purchase one of these units, they have to um, get financing for the whole price of that home, which is an affordable price. So they usually come in at close to 100% of the value of, of that home. 97% perhaps, 95 if they have a higher down payment. When you add on top of that our note, which could be for 50, 60, 70,000, then again, that's where that issue comes of the combined loan to values. And explain to me again the concept of recapturing the value of the note. Does the city hold the notes? We do, correct. Those are. Uh, so you finance those through. So it wasn't. Some other we, we never really financed them. It was a way to capture that difference between the actual value of that unit, the market value, and the affordable price that it was originally sold at. So we made sure that we captured that in a note and secured it against the property so that in the future we would be able to, to capture those funds. Okay or if they had to sell it at market, we would be able to capture that difference. Good, thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. I would uh, like to make a motion to authorize the staff to modify the inclusionary housing program as described to respond to the stricter mortgage lending rules and expedite the unit resale request, as well as authorize the city manager or his designee to approve the individual regulatory agreement modifications and execute any documents to approve and expedite unit sales. Do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the uh, general administration. Um, do we have any requests and comments from the commissioners? None at this time. <clears throat> Moving on to the staff update. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and thanks for that uh, discussion on that last item. I know we had a light agenda tonight, so I'm glad we, we got as many questions as we did. I know it's uh, probably a new uh, uh, issue for some of you, at least, that weren't on the Housing Commission, but uh, that was that was good feedback or good, uh, good questions. So uh, we had a light agenda tonight, but we will have a more substantive one in, I believe it's November 7th? 9th. Okay, yeah, 9th. <laughs> November 9th is the next meeting um, and uh, just to give you a preview of that uh, we actually were gonna have this tonight but due to scheduling conflicts we had to switch it around but we'll have representatives from the uh, greater Sacramento um, 
Area Economic Council. Um, we don't know exactly who yet, but, but we're going to have someone from their organization come. They're, they're now the, it's not so new anymore, they're about a couple years into it now, but uh, they're the uh, regional uh, business recruitment um, arm, and uh, we were a member of, of uh, that group, and we work very closely with them on uh, business recruitments. And so we're going to have that presentation, and then Diane Richards, who heads up our business recruitment and retention efforts, is going to follow that with a, a, a presentation on what we do around uh, business recruitment, just to get you more familiar with that. Uh, but then we're also going to have um, an update on uh, the city's formation of its Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. Um, that is going forward to council. Uh, You've heard me talk about it before. Uh, we're going to actually do a council workshop in October. So the timing of, of your commission meeting um, didn't quite work out to have it done before, but it's just a workshop. So we'll, we'll sort of repeat the workshop there, uh, get any feedback you have. And then the formation process will get going in earnest in November, uh, later in November in, the, in, in that month. Um, so that's uh, what we have for the next meeting. Aaron, uh, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, how does the city work with Valley Vision? Um, Valley Vision is, you know, they sort of operate their uh, programs, and once in a while they'll ask us to um, either participate or host an event. But we don't have any formal uh, business relationship with them. We're, they're not a membership organization, so... Um, so our role with them is more, um, you know, we participate in their events, but that's that's about the extent of it. I saw today that they got a big grant to attract agricultural businesses to the region. Yeah, and actually, actually, that's a good point. So they do have um, something that's called Ag Plus, and it's a um, it's an initiative they started with, I believe, Fresno State and a couple of other regional organizations. And the whole idea is they were funded by an EDA grant um, to, you know look at attracting ag investment into the Central Valley. So we, we are a member of that effort, um, and a lot of the other cities in the region are too. Um, I, I didn't see what they got most recently, but it could have something to do with that. So, yeah. And then just a couple other things I wanted to highlight in terms of events that are coming up. On October 14th, uh, this will be a Friday at 10 a.m., we are opening uh, the north segment of Village Parkway. So that's the roadway that's between the McGowan Bridge and yeah, so yeah, basically yeah. if you live in uh, the east part of Southport or if you live north and you want to get to Target and Nugget get faster school. or school, oh. yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, that's going to be a really important uh, a route. Uh, but also it's a, it's a huge um, uh, infrastructure investment for the, the Stonelock property, which the port owns, which, you know, is part of the uh, it's a, kind of a division of the city. So it's a, it's a big deal for a lot of reasons. So definitely, uh, if you can attend, you're welcome to attend that. Um, and then just one other thing I'd point out, just because it's gotten a lot of notice, the Friday nights at the barn, that runs through the end of the month. If you haven't been out there yet to see the barn um, or, or uh, the off-the-grid events are a great way to experience um, kind of what the city had in mind when we uh, made, when the council made the initial investment um, in partnership with Fulcrum on that project. So, but the last one is uh, October 28th. It'll be every Friday up until then. Uh, and then that's about it. If you had any other questions, I'd be happy to take those at this time, or uh, otherwise we'll see you in November. Yeah. So what's the status of the, uh, the firehouse restaurant? Mm -hmm. And then I also saw a, uh, was reading in the business journal about the Broderick do another project at the yeah right okay so so yeah I'll take those in order so uh, first on the firehouse the project we're, we're really proud of the progress it's made um, so DNS uh, development is the developer uh, burgers and brew has already been announced as the as the uh, restaurant operator uh, it's a two-floor building I would love to get you guys in there for a tour but we're they're getting close to finishing it out so we will have a grand opening event that you'll be invited to um, but uh, they're planning to open sometime in November. I don't have an exact date yet, but and I don't think they do either. Uh, but uh, they're finishing out the interior, uh, so it'll be a Burgers and Brew um, like the one they have in you know Midtown and, and in Davis on the ground floor. I, uh, I think the format upstairs will be like a jazz club, but that area will also be available. Uh, I believe they're going to have available for banquets and that kind of thing. It's a beautiful space up there. They've they've done the outdoor uh, uh, patio. Um, and there's lots of outdoor space on the ground floor, so we, we hope it'll be really successful, and we're, you know, obviously excited. We also did all the uh, off-site work that's all, all but complete now, the wide sidewalk, the new parking lot, 
Uh, so that project's come together really nicely. And then just down the street, the other one, uh, the, the garage, the Fifth Street or C Street garage, what we've been calling it, uh, it's at the corner of uh, Fifth and C. Um, and it's it's a building that we've owned ever since we widened Fifth Street. Kind of sat there. We used it to store stuff for a while. Uh, but uh, Chris Yaros, who's the the owner of Broderick and every other restaurant in Sacramento, um, <laughs> bought us a proposal in response to an RFP we did um, to do sort of a um, it's like a market that will do coffee in the morning and maybe pizza and stuff at night. Um, you know, uh, kind of a they're, they're sort of still figuring out the concept, but we have. Uh, uh, exclusive negotiating agreement. Actually, we have a purchase and sale agreement with them now. Uh, so we have a contract for them to do the project. Um, they're just getting started, uh, but we're hoping that they'll be, you know, going forward with design and hopefully have that project underway next year. Uh, but that one's definitely, you know, going to lag behind the firehouse, but uh, hopefully it'll be our next addition to the Washington neighborhood. So did, did I answer everything? Okay. But we do have one more restaurant that opened this week, right? Just one? Just across the street. Lenise's. That's right, yeah. Lenise's is now in the community uh -huh. center. So uh, serving Insight Coffee, too, so I'm happy about that. And uh, I thought you meant Chondo's. Well, Chondo's. Chondo's is open. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> but I'm really excited for Lenise, being a, a small business person that yeah. took one business that was not doing well and really turned it around and now she's expanding to a second location. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. Very exciting. All right, anything else? Mr. I'll Chairman, I have from oh, go, go uh, ahead. the statewide public finance conference where West Sacramento's EIFD was recognized. Great. A few. Yeah, we're still, I think we're on track to still be the first one in the state. Whether or not that, it might be the only one in the state for a long time. There's but another, but uh, <laughs> I think you guys are right there. You'll be the first to form on yeah. that. Right. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay. So I was asked to remind you all that at the end of the year, your current term ends, and you are invited to reapply. There will be some letters that were sent to you by the city, and you can also reapply on our website. If you have any questions, you can email me, and I'll walk you through the process. But we would like you all to reapply. All right. Is that it for calendar of events? Do we have anything? Um, did we have a point of clarification about the next meeting? Yes. Wednesday, November 9th is our next meeting. Okay. So listen to Polly, not me. Wednesday, November 9th. <laughs> All right. All right. If we have nothing further, it is now 6.33 p.m. And I will adjourn. <laughs>